Hi, and welcome to the Environment TV Forum. I'm Charlie Olson, your host and moderator for today. We'll be talking about congestion pricing and an interesting trip to Cuba by way of Montreal with Lenny Labrizzi, social ecologist. Ken Gale, a radio talk show host and a nonfiction writer and a comic book writer. Mark Latour, a writer of uh, environmental legislation and a land conservationist. When we were preparing our show on congestion pricing, Lenny came across an eight minute video made in Stockholm, Sweden, that we both thought was very helpful as an intro to our discussion. We decided to show that first and then to dive into our talk. So sit back and enjoy the incredible view and we'll be back right after. Stockholm. Street Films is in Stockholm. I'm Gersh Kunzman, along with Clarence Eckerson. We're in Stockholm trying to capture all of the changes a city can make when it institutes congestion pricing and starts reclawing back space from cars. So we're standing at Svedenborgsgatan in the area of Södermalm in Stockholm. And this is a very popular street, and especially since 2015, where it was the first pilot of a summer street in Stockholm. And is now a very popular place to come, both for pedestrians and for cyclists. And at this point, we have 44 summer streets all around Stockholm. My responsibility is the space between buildings, and I focus on areas and flows. So we want to create value with the areas we have between the buildings and we do that by making it compelling, uh, by uh, places to sit and uh, art or uh, trees and, and, and greens and so on. But then we also want to make sure that the flows also work. In uh, some months we will introduce a low emission zone which will uh, force the transports to become uh, uh, cleaner, but it also triggers the innovation and to, uh, to share transportation um, ways and to, to use more last mile delivery and so on. So we try to combine those. All right, so now we're on an interesting street here. This used to be a two-way traffic clogged street. It's a key artery, or at least it was a key artery. But now, since COVID and since congestion pricing, they've turned it into more or less a pedestrianized street, although cars are still allowed. They've widened the sidewalks. They've added in dining sheds. They've added in planters. They've added in benches. They've added in art. During the day, around lunchtime, this place is packed and more importantly, very few cars actually come through here. It used to be uh, uh, the central business district where not so many people wanted to stay during the night and it didn't have so many restaurants and so on. And that is uh, the area where we're introducing this low emission zone. And as a part of that, we also want to invest in the area. We also want to widen the sidewalks and get more trees and greens. And, and the store owners and the restaurant owners are also very, very happy to collaborate with the city to, to make the area more attractive for people. And right here is something Clarence and I noticed. We were walking with a city official yesterday and we said, oh, tell us about that. He said, oh, that just happened today, which was yesterday. There's the old sidewalk line. And what they did is they triple widened the sidewalk by taking a lane from this once two-way street, making it a one-way street, much less traffic on it now. It's no longer a through street through a neighborhood, and now it's a neighborhood street. But look at how much more space you can have in a city when you reduce traffic by 17 to 20%, as they did here in Stockholm. This is so new, it's the, all the cement and the sand is still here, it, like sand's in the hourglass, and they're here right now cleaning it up, finalizing it for the people. Jakobsgatan is one of the streets uh, we turn into a street with more uh, space for, for pedestrians and, and people sitting in the sun. Now, not every street in Stockholm has been reclaimed from the automobile. Here's a kind of a before shot. You see this is a two-way street, you got trucks and all this stuff. There's not a lot of life on that street because there's no benches, there's nothing. But Clarence, turn it around 180 degrees. This is the after shot. This is what they did up to this point. They widened the sidewalk, they added benches, you got bike parking, you got trees, you got planters. And this is what that other street that we saw that it opened up just today is gonna look like in a couple of months with all these people and life.
Now, of course, this guy needs no introduction to you Americans. King Gustav, of course. Now, if you look broadly at this circle, he used to be in the middle of a traffic sewer. Nobody could come and enjoy this. Before the, the spot in front of the opera house here was a roundabout and it was, uh, there were parkings. But together with the city and with the opera and with other uh, real estate owners in the area, we have uh, changed the place and, and made it to uh, a nicer place. People who come to the opera and want to uh, maybe take a glass before the show or want to go out and eat afterwards, they can feel very um, at home. But all they did was they cut off one part of the circle, blocking cars from this. They added in planters, they added in benches. People are enjoying it. And now cars coming off this bridge, cars coming through the circle can't cut through here. They got rid of a parking lot in front of the opera house. And now you can hang out with King Gustav II. You can get to know him and just enjoy a public space that's for the public, not just for car drivers. So I grew up in Stockholm and then when I was a kid not so many people used to cycle. Less than 1% of trips in Stockholm were made by bike and now we see that 32% uh, in the inner city use bike to and from work on a, on a nice day during the spring. You see behind me a bike lane that was widened because during the rush hour period this is crazy. That's why we had to come out during the day when it's a little calmer. This is a bike super highway that gets people from sort of the west side of town to the south side of town through this crazy intersection that's mobbed with bikes. And we are really trying to accommodate this increased amount of cyclists so more people want to cycle and can feel safe when they cycle. And we do that with new infrastructure, but we're also take, uh, testing new technology. For example, we have a sensor in uh, this intersection, which sort of detects how many cyclists are waiting, and then it turns it green faster to make it easier for cyclists to feel safe and also to get a good flow through the city. Once enough cyclists end up at a red light, the red light turns green for cyclists because it gives them priority when there's a lot of them, but obviously gives other modes priority when there aren't a lot of them. So Jötgatan is uh, one of the uh, main streets that connects the, the southern suburbs to the city center of Stockholm. And uh, there are thousands of cyclists, I think it's 15,000 cyclists uh, going there every day to and from work. And it's also a street where we have had to widen the bike paths in steps. So we made first bike paths in one uh, width and then we had to expand them. And now we are um, starting up a project to expand them even more. So another thing about when you take space back from car drivers, you don't have to only just give it to pedestrians or make bike lanes. You can also create bike parking and scooter parking. And all these scooters might otherwise be littering the sidewalk. Instead, they put them in the roadway where they belong and they're where a car might have been, but now you make 10 or 12 parking spaces for bikes and scooters. So the congestion charges who um, are now in place in Stockholm, that is a very interesting story in its own. Uh, the people were not very positive towards it in the beginning, but then it was a test period. And all of a sudden you could see how people realized that the transportation flows are much more efficient. People didn't necessarily stop using the car, but they used it more cleverly. And this incentive structure just made transportation work better. And that has been a success story in many ways. And also the money that you get in uh, are then invested in projects, uh, subways and, and trams and so on. Thanks to the, the congestion charge, we also see an increase in cycling and, and walking. And that in, in itself also creates more ways to, to use the area. Well, they don't call this the sluicing for nothing. Look at the current going. And that's where I'm going to sign off. I'm Gersh Custom for Clarence Eckerson and Street Films, live in Stockholm. Enjoy the view. As I said, that's quite an incredible view. What shall we start with? Who wants to comment first? A few key points from that video. Uh, just like here, when they first proposed uh, the congestion pricing, there was a lot of pushback by members of the community. He didn't really specify who in particular, but here in New York, there's a lot of pushback against it. 
And I think the same that in London, which is the other major city that has congestion pricing, the same kind of thing happened. The improvements in the built the the bike infrastructure was just stunning you know some of that's going on here but uh, much more could be done he didn't really get into improvements in the mass transportation sector there but either they had excess capacity or they added to that not sure in particular but the idea with the congestion pricing money here would be to put that money into improvements in the mass transit system, whether that be the buses or the subways. The, uh, one of the things that I liked about it was that um, in terms of payment, you know, uh, the payment you get billed automatically at the end of each month. And that just makes it so easy. It's just like dealing with your gas bill or your electric bill. And uh, you can... Uh, so the more you use it, the more you pay. The less you use it, the less you pay. And I noticed that in some places that have the uh, congestion pricing, they even give discounts to people of lower income, they, which I suppose we can do with, with gas bills and electric bills already. But I think the ease of use, like not having toll booths or anything, uh, would make it much more palatable to a lot of people. Well, the, the technology is probably one reason why it can happen so easily at least in terms of that part of it 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 hasn't happened easily and the reason we're talking about this now is that it's on hold but it it's been in the works for probably at least 15 years from when that was first proposed there's a whole bunch of permitting and environmental assessments and and analysis that had to go on and the the whole thing was delayed for four years when th during the first during Trump's presidency because they wouldn't there was a key thing that the federal government had to do to say that that it could move forward and that's sort of strange to think about why you know why would the the federal government have control but part of the reason is that there are federal roads in New York City. And so they had to approve those roads being part of this whole system. Um, once uh, President Biden took office, they uh, you know, moved that along. And But it's still, it's a, almost four years. It's still taken until it was supposed to go into effect June 30th. It's still taken until then with all of the hearings and all of the the paperwork that had to be filed and lawsuits, as is always the case when anybody wants to do anything in New York. I remember reading a lot of articles when congestion pricing was first proposed. Uh, I'm a walker, so I thought, well, yeah, that's, that's pretty cool that they're even thinking of it. And... What most of the articles would talk about is how there was opposition to congestion pricing in every city that proposed it. And in some cases, a mayor of a city, say Helsinki in Finland, would put in congestion pricing. People would get mad at him. They'd vote him out. And then the new mayor would put the traffic back in. And then people are like, oh, my God, what have we done? And they decided they liked congestion pricing after all. They liked a car-free area of the capital. You know, bring back the old mayor and let's make everything nice again. And this happened in, in cities all over. I, I know in Europe and Asia, and I think in Africa too. And one of the things that baffled me is if it kept happening, why didn't anybody learn from that? Uh, that obviously congestion pricing and making less cars and trucks in, in a crowded part of the city is a good thing after all. And the second biggest city in Finland, I forgot its name, uh, they put in congestion pricing. They voted the mayor out and they voted the mayor back in. The same thing. It's like, wait a minute, why did they learn it from the other city in their same country? Well, what 
Governor Hochul learned was she does not want to lose her job. And, and the, the politicians from the suburbs around New York City, Westchester and Long Island, did not want to lose their jobs. So they don't they did not want this to, co to come into play during this election season. And that's why, in my opinion, that's why it, it was uh, put on hold. The governor used the economy as the reason, but, but it, it seems like the, it improves the economy rather than than puts a dent in it where it's been put into effect. So that that was that that's a false argument right there. But she you can't say, well, I, I'm stopping it because I want to keep my job, you know. <laughs> yeah. We just so they learned, they, can they learn that part, but they didn't <laughs> learn they didn't learn how to make it more palatable to to everyone. Yeah, I guess that's why that video from Stockholm, you know, really centered on how many businesses were able to open after the congestion was taken away. Uh, and it, you know, it makes sense. Or there's, there's, if there's less room for cars, there's more room for businesses. There's more room for people. Yeah, the, the, the again, leading up to this, a tremendous amount of numbers crunching went on in terms of, you, you know, how many less cars, how many dollars, you know, what was the sweet spot in terms of, of the, you know, what should the number be that you have to pay each time you come into the into the 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 zone, um, and uh, and research was done about the businesses and 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 how businesses might be affected by less people driving in, and it really came up with the fact that most of the customers of Midtown, that's what we're like talking about, Midtown and Lower Manhattan businesses do not drive there they walk from their homes they take a they take a cab they take a bus they take a train and that would the fact that there won't be traffic would only make that that shopping experience all the all the more nice all nicer for someone yeah i'm thinking nassau street in lower manhattan uh, when there's no cars, it's it's because if a car is driving by your store, well, they're not stopping in. If a person's walking by your store, there's a good chance you can lure them in. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's better for business. Um, I don't know if any of you got to watch uh, Channel Seven WABC during the end of May of this year, and during uh, yeah uh, during a bit of June, they did a twenty thirty day report on London and other places on congestion pricing. And uh, I saw some of that and it turned me into being negative for congestive pricing. First of all, I don't think it's really gonna help the greenhouse gases. I don't think it's going yeah. to get the, uh, uh, the cars out of there. And London showed that it wasn't getting the cars out. They raised money, but they weren't getting the cars out. They had video photographs, videos, not just photographs, but videos of 20 years ago and what it looked like. And today they had it, the day that they were actually showing it on air. And the congestion was exactly the same. Cars all over the place. And they went around asking uh, the pedestrians, what do they think? And the pedestrian said, the cars seem the same as when I was younger and when I saw this, uh, the, the smell is still the same. Uh, there seems to be more businesses uh, but I don't see any real change other than we're paying more for it. Now, I didn't do in-depth analysis as Lenny has seen some of these in-depth analysis and the video we just saw. I don't think that's anywhere as crowded as New York City or as Mexico City could be or as Tokyo could be. Um, and those are places that may try this, or Hong Kong or Singapore, or Shanghai. Um, so I'm on the negative side of that but especially because if they really want to get rid of the greenhouse gases, why not make the whole area electrified? Only electric cars can go in there, electric buses, trams, that kind of stuff, and make that somehow free. Oh, Charlie. I am a dreamer. <laughs> no, 
<laughs> electric cars are just moving the the emissions from the tailpipe to the power plant and you're doubling and tripling the emissions you can't just make everything electric and think you're going to remove all of all of the emissions right away because the electricity has to come from somewhere and right now the electricity comes from methane it comes from what they call natural gas so you've got to make the grid cleaner now if people are buying solar panels at the same time as electric cars that cleans the grid in in, in several different ways but it uh, electric good, yeah. is not a, a, a panacea unless it, it comes with a, a greater way of thinking about it well, it, absolutely. The, correct. the law in it, you know, about congestion pricing in in New York is that it has to raise one billion dollars a year, and that one billion dollars a year can leverage about fifteen billion dollars in bonds that can be used to fund various uh, climate mitigation strategies. I know. They're talking about doing something in the South Bronx because when they calculated traffic, you know, with the with congestion pricing, people will use different routes. And one of them would be through the South Bronx. And there there was money that was set aside to to make some improvements there in the South Bronx. Um so I don't it wasn't clear to me from that video if any of that money went in stockholm went to to mass transit or the other again the other big city is london and whether that was the case there but it has to come let you know making it more difficult for people to drive in the city has to come with making it easier and more pleasant and safer for people to use other modes of transportation whether that be bicycle Bike share, subways, buses, ferries, the monorails that Charlie wants us to build. Another aspect of it too is that um, the congestion pricing ideally will get rid of, will minimize some of the um, emissions that come from idling because there's a lot of traffic jams uh, happening at certain hours. And if you can spread out that traffic, you're, you all have, a lot of the auto emissions are not going to exist because the traffic can flow more freely. So to the extent that uh, that occurs, you know, that is a positive uh, for the city. So I, I, I came across this, this um, countdown clock type of thing online today. Um, uh, and I, it, if I could screen share it if you want. Sure. All right, you, do you see that the numbers are actually moving? Yes. So today, today is day 16 without congestion pricing. Mm -hmm. And since tolling did not happen, over 2 million cars have not been removed from the congestion zone. I didn't calculate how much how many that is per day, but that's a lot. Um, and to, to answer your uh, um, question, Mark, 109,000 tons of carbon dioxide have been in, emitted and not saved so that's less pollution or more pollution because it hasn't gone into effect and in just 16 days they would have raised 42 million dollars to fund transportation and again the whole idea of traffic 6000 no 623338 hours of wasted time would have been avoided if congestion pricing uh, would have gone into effect because of there being less traffic. Well, this so, is something we have to, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead, Lynn. The point is that the, the positives to me outweigh the negatives. The implementation and what's gonna happen with the money, of course, you know, that's, that becomes political and, you know, who's in charge and where does the money go and is it equitable where the money's being spent? Um, but all of these factors in terms of 
the environment are a key aspect of why congestion pricing is so important to, to put into place. Another reason why I am, well, there's a lot more to find out about this. It'd be an ongoing thing to check those facts out and see if that's really what would happen. Um, uh, as I said, in the example of London from WABC TV, that those cars were not uh, exempt, uh, not exempted, that they just didn't disappear. They were still coming. So if you had electric cars and they were backed up, I mean, buses, et cetera, with generating plants that use renewable energy, that would be a better way. Another argument that I have for all the work that should be going on in these uh, trans the, uh, subways is that when we, as we're going forward in time, we're going to see more sea level rise. I think it's a waste of time to put the money into underground things that are gonna be flooded and we should be pushing it above ground whether we use Disneyland kind of trams that are one, two, three stories above, the trains are up there, or uh, we have them street level, but we don't, We should be moving away from the coast definitely over the next hundred years and spending our money and our thinking that way, as well as the environmental justice ways that uh, Lenny was beginning to talk about. This isn't deep enough planning to me. It's, it seems to be more of a waste of money and I realize I'm a big minority <laughs> and the case from, I'm from Staten Island and the case in Staten Island brought by our borough president lost. And he used the wrong kind of arguments as far as I'm concerned, because we're not really going after the greenhouse gases. So uh, there's much more to uh, talk about and think about and check on all of these facts and figures more so, but we're bringing it up here just to bring some of the uh, thoughts about that. Mark, Lenny, Ken. Uh, yeah, just a question for Lenny. Uh, can you remind us of the pricing model for the New York City proposal? In other words, if I drove a car in in the in right in the rush hour, how much would I pay? The peak uh, rate is fifteen dollars for a car. I don't really know what the the truck and the other things. The there they did a an interesting thing that. New York City medallion taxis, the yellow taxis, um, uh, do not get told, but they they have a they put a I don't know I think it's a dollar fifty surcharge on each each ride, but the the Ubers and Lyfts do get charged, <laughs> um, so that's kind of interesting. And there's a lower rate if you come in at night, off peak hours. And what about the uh, police, fire department, the teachers, the uh, sanitation people, um, the construction workers who come in and out and in and out and do work there, renovation people? They are not people of a higher salary. And some of them will be jumping from detective spot to inspection spot to this spot in and out with their work. Have, I haven't heard anything other than complaining that they're going to be uh, taxed in this sense. But have you heard anything further? Uh, there are some exemptions. I don't think that any city workers get exempt by their job, you know, driving to their office or dri driving to their station. But the, the fire trucks and the police cars uh, don't get uh, um, told, but for the most part, you know, New York City has fire stations and precincts where it's very it's a very local thing. Police cars don't generally move across boroughs or from Brooklyn into Manhattan. There's there's enough police in Manhattan to deal with Manhattan for the most part. You know, if there's ra uh, rallies or demonstrations, that might not be the case, but that's why it was so difficult to to get this thing to happen was because there were so many well what if what about these people what about right, those yeah. people mm -hmm. and 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 the bottom line is a lot of most of the research that i've seen is that first off the majority of new yorkers do not own cars 
here in Staten Island, we're a little bit different. We are, right. you when, know, you, when you say New York, as you, as we all make this mistake, you mean Manhattan, right? I mean, New York City residents. If you count all New York City residents, there's still a majority of New York City residents that don't own a car. That includes Staten Island, Brooklyn, Queens, all those places. And part of the reason is that they can get on a subway or they can get on a bus to get to where they need to go. Um, obviously there's issues with all those modes of transportation, but the majority of New Yorkers do not own cars. And that is a very, it, that's very connected to income. So in the, the argument that this is gonna impact low income residents of New York City is that has no weight because you have to be above a certain income in order to own a car first off, and then even think about driving into, into Manhattan. Uh, obviously people have to go in for hospital visits or, or other things like that, but the majority of the trips were gonna be by people in the upper income levels. Over three quarters of Manhattanites do not own cars. Right, but it's, but the majority of all of New York City, all all those uh, suburban homes in the outer boroughs, um, a lot of them have cars. A lot of them don't. Yeah, uh, the majority do not because they just walk over to the subway and 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 get to work or get to the movies or whatever. Uh, Lenny, can you tell us a little bit about uh, that image behind you? Um, sure. That is called Grand Central Madison. And what it is, is the, the, the project, which again, it was one of these 20 year projects was, uh, called Eastside Access. And that was for, so the Long Island Railroad, all the trains go into Penn Station, which is on the west side of Manhattan. And if you come in from Long Island on in, into Penn Station and have to work on the east side of Manhattan, it there's an additional commute once once that happens. Um, so this was going to allow the Long Island Railroad trains to stop on the east side of Manhattan, so the, those folks would have a much shorter commute. Um, it, they created this tremendous. I mean, that hallway behind me, go, <laughs> you can't see the end of it. It goes on, I think, for at least eight blo city blocks. And it connects, um, it, there, that, that's where all the, the, the platforms are that you can get off of the train and, um, and then make your way up to the street um, or to um, the subway. It, it's a, in some ways it's a little bit of a boondoggle. They they really should have had moving sidewalks or people movers on that long corridor so that you know especially older folks could get from one end to the other without walking basically a half a mile. Um, but that's what that is behind me. Are there any bicycles uh, let? Uh, allowed in there or any no, scooters no. or mopeds? no this is a, this is actually several levels underground yeah it's amazing yeah i i'm just it doesn't look like it's part of new york city there's no train station that looks anywhere near that that i've seen there usually the new york city tra uh, trains are ugly dirty grayish <laughs> you know, well that's beautiful you know, that's like washington dc that brings up one of the you know one of the the projects that was going to be funded is an extension of the second avenue subway again this is like a, a hundred year project mm -hmm. and um that's been in, in on the books for you know since i think the 1930s but um they put in stations on second avenue at 59th street 72nd Street and 86th Street, I believe. And the they were going to extend it at least up to 125th Street using funds 
from the congestion pricing to leverage bonds to continue the work. And that, that like the day, July 1st, all work stopped on that project. And those subway stations, Charlie, you must go visit because they're, they're, they, they would make you believe you were in Washington, D.C. or Moscow, where there's chandeliers in the subway station. Well, I love that kind of looking. It's forward looking. Uh, but that's not the miles and miles and miles of the rest of uh, Harlem, Spanish Harlem. I, I wish I, the second having your subway stations had been designed by people who actually take the subway. And I wish the designs were approved by people who take the subway because they seem to have no conception of what it's like to be on, on those trains. Uh, every subway station of the Second Avenue subway looks the same. Uh, the stairways are in the same places. The escalators are in the same places. The elevators are in the And so what happens is that since people are ride the subway where the exit is, everybody's in this same car. So one car is virtually uh, empty and the other one's standing room only. They're next to each other because one is near every single escalator up uh, and, and and the other one is not. Um, all the other subway stations, they scatter where the exits are. They're not all in the exact same place. So when, when a New Yorker asks another New Yorker, you know, how do I get to, to your place? Do I ride in the front of the train or the back of the train? It's because there is a specific place to, to get out. Uh, the second annual subway, they didn't do that. Uh, they also, uh, there's about, they, they put the the name of the stop, you know, 72, 86, 96 on the wall. They paint it black on white, but they have half as many as other stations. So if you're in a crowded subway train or even a not crowded one, you don't know what stop you're at because every station looks the same. And you can't see the numbers of what station you're at. Um, I hope that whoever designs the subway stops for the rest of the Second Avenue subway uh, either talks to somebody who takes the train. <laughs> I agree that that is a big problem with many of these cities looking forward. It's easier to build something like Rest in Virginia which is a model for the United States and was supposed to be. Silicon Valley was another one of those, I believe, where they have the open space and they can build the streets that they want because nothing is there, or Las Vegas kind of thing. But we don't have that in the city. And right now we have a number of futuristic uh, ideas on the planning that are being voted on at the city council. One is called the city of yes, and another is called the rapid bus system or something like that. And they do exactly what you're alluding to here, Ken, and that is they're not bringing in the common people. These are academic, uh, architectural professionals of all kinds of levels who are dreaming these things up without the input of the regular people. How to get the regular people in there is rather difficult when you're thinking further and future, uh, futuristically. And I think they're leaving out uh, the, the uh, organizations that Ken Stanley Robinson who thinks of these things and other worldview and futurists think about when they're planning cities for the next three, 400 years. Where are we going? What's the climate going to be like? What's the rising sea levels going to be like? This seems to be all left out. I've gone further in my thinking right here into, you might call it science fiction, but Ken starting at the basic level and that's saying, where are the simplistic practical ideas of the viewpoint of the common person who's going to ride the damn thing. And that's the same in the hospitals. I'm a nurse and I've watched where they don't make mm -hmm. room for the uh, nursing procedures and for the, uh, just the hallways and the setup for where the nursing station is and what's in the room and where the emergency things are. It's just not thought out with the patients in mind. And it's just amazing to me that so much can be left out. So I, uh, I may sound like a conservative Republican saying some of these things, uh, but I'm just trying to make common sense of this. And I do hope it works out better. Uh, it, it's all minimum I mean, bid. And the minimum bid comes from all over. So the people who get the minimum bid uh, get there because they don't consult anybody. They don't think about anything. And uh, they're not from New York City. They don't know how New York works. They, 
I, I think something like a constitutional <coughs> convention of New York City for the architecture or the subways should be done. And that's where you get a number of people together, open publicly. This is what we'd like to see change in the city. And that's not going to happen, but that would be really nice. And then out openly, they argue it out, discuss it out in many ways so that many voices do it instead of behind the scenes in the back room doors of professional, highly incredible professionals. And I see that also, I forgot to mention, I'm helping out at the community board, the local community board, and I see the city of yes, I hear them come and talk or the rapid transit or some of these other things. And I just see how they do not incorporate the, uh, the people and the, the Community boards throughout the city, the vast majority, are voting against the city of yes and the rapid bus transit method and some of these other ideas that are made before they bring them to the people. But we do all have hope that... Uh, you do? Well, I do. <laughs> yes, I have hope that the image behind Lenny is the image of the future and that Ken's ideas of bringing people in like us uh, just regular people, not that we're experts, can make it better. Um, and the, the visions that all of these wonderful people have that are putting this together actually comes to fruition. The the environmental case for congestion pricing is very strong. And and to me, that's really what the bottom line is. We, if we want a livable city, we need to have less cars driving in Manhattan. And however we get to that, Maybe it's not congestion pricing. Maybe there's another way, although the other ways are probably harder on more people than congestion pricing is on the people who can afford it. Mark, did you want to say anything further? Well, yeah, and it does touch on another, a lot of other issues, you know, like walking downtowns and community character, uh, which are very important. But uh, yeah, it's definitely something uh, we need to. Uh, continue to look at and implement. And there are things that we agree with, and they're simple things, like giving up smoking in public places. How the devil did we ever come to agree with that without having a, a civil war? Or picking up your poop, the dog poop. Look at that. That's incredible that we do that. And there's other things like that that we agree on, paying taxes for the most part. <laughs> so something I think will happen from this. What it is, I don't know. Sometimes we get a special treat by actually being able to show something that is rather difficult to find out about, and that's what happened recently to Mark. He had the extraordinary chance to see a part of the world that isn't easily accessible to most Americans. And he calls it close encounters with nature in Cuba and Montreal. Okay, Mark, let us know. Sure, okay. So I was lucky enough to be on vacation uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago in Cuba. So I went with a group of friends who go there every year. They go in June of every year. And for the most part, to go to Cuba, you need to be part of a group for a particular purpose. You don't generally wander on your own. Um, and uh, so this group was basically at a resort, a beach resort. And uh, it was on the north side of Cuba. So it's almost uh, due south of Key West, Florida. Um, the area is called a Varadero, which is a Spanish term. It means a boat slip or a marina, a place where you would launch a boat into the water. So it's a peninsula on the north side of Cuba. It goes for close to 20 miles. It's only about one mile wide at the widest. And it's loaded with uh, uh, resorts, like all inclusive resorts. So there's close to 60 of them. And it's actually an important way for Cuba to get foreign exchange funds. It employs quite a lot of people, a tremendous number of people. Over 50,000 just on this little peninsula are working in the uh, these resort hotels uh, on the island. And uh, so it was quite beautiful. Uh, the resort was maybe 15 acres, maybe 20. It had beachfront, a huge uh, you know, outdoor swimming pools. Uh, the water was extremely warm. 
Um, one of the nice things about it was um, they don't have any motorized vehicles out in that area. So um, it's all catamarans, you know, there's no gas, no propane, no oil coming from the boats. And I guess the idea is to keep it clean, maybe not so much necessarily to protect the environment, but for tourists who want to go snorkeling or swimming or scuba <laughs> diving or fishing. And, uh, but, you know, it does protect, protect the environment at the same time. So, um, well, I'm very happy it that was... it protects, Mark, I'm very happy that it protects the environment, but I, you, you, you were saying that probably they're doing it for the tourists. Our American tourists love those motorboats, love all the rest of that junk. Yeah. It's greenhouse gas guzzling. So I think they may be doing it there. Ken may have another idea on this, but uh, they in Cuba, they may be doing that for the uh, environment. What do you think? Uh, they don't have the gas. Ah, that's a very practical answer. I like that. <laughs> they, they just don't have the gas. The the embargo okay. uh, keeps them from, from using anything like that. All right. You know, okay, Cuba, so. Cuba was also a model for organic farming ever since Castro took over because they didn't have the chemicals. So they had right. to they wow. had to grow organically because they there were no chemicals to put onto their onto their vegetables and sugarcane and whatever else they were tobacco. <clears throat> wow, there were no jet skis and nothing like that. Um, but it did make it good in terms of uh, snorkeling uh, over the coral reefs and things like that. So um, curiously, the uh, they have little stores, you know, here and there. But what do you see being sold in the stores? Of course, cigars, of course, rum. But uh, they've got, uh, they're still selling uh, Che Guevara hats. <laughs> they're still selling um, the Fidel Castro hats, uh, <laughs> books about how to make a revolution, uh, things like that. So um, that's what the tourists were privy to. They had a lot of arts and crafts uh, uh, fairs that we could go to that were, uh, very nice as well. There, as I mentioned, there are a lot of people working there, not just in housekeeping and not just in landscaping, and not just in the kitchens and the restaurants, but also in um, entertainment. Uh, every night we had big uh, musical extravaganzas, big dancing extravaganzas. You know, the staff, they had American type rock and roll groups. They had um, uh, games and activities like they were leading, say, volleyball games. They were leading, you know, word games, trying to get the people involved and uh, bring up the energy level. One afternoon, it was the last day that I was there. I was in the ocean with a friend. The water was nice and warm. And a, a guy came swimming by. I kind of waved hello to him because he thought he, I thought he'd been one of the people on our snorkeling trip the day before. Turned out he wasn't, but he came up to us and he talked talked to us. And he started looking at my legs and then he asked me for my pants. So I have like a, a long pair of swimwear that go from the ankle up to the waist to keep from getting the sun on me and getting sunburned. So he said, he walks along the beach all day long, selling cigars and cigarettes. He often dives into the water to cool down. But he said he was worried about getting skin cancer and could he have my pants? So <laughs> since it was the last day, of course I gave him my swim pants. And it was easy enough to do. But he said to me that, you know, the locals, that they don't have regular shopping. They can't go to a Macy's or to a mall or to a, a Nordstrom or a stop and shop the way we can. Uh, they can't order over Amazon or anything like that. So there's no way he could have gotten something like this uh, without me giving it to him. Wow. So I was happy to do that. And, uh, you know, we went down anyway, knowing that the people were fairly poor and wanting you know, wanting to bring them things like magazines and books, uh, clothing, sunglasses. So we did that and we gave them tips whenever there was an excuse uh, to give them a tip. So, uh, uh, you know, hopefully we helped them a little bit and we became close with a lot of the workers at the resort because we spent so much time with them, uh, especially in the, the activities and the restaurants. Well, that shows some of the problem that happens between capitalism, socialism, communism, and different forms of economics. The people want what they want, the inventions, like the pair of pants, that simple thing. The audaciousness of this person to come up to you and say, give me your pants, whether nicely or not, 
who the hell yeah. is this person to say that kind of thing? And you're so kind to give it to him. I mean, oh. that. But the, the 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 desire is there for something that can be what they think is better, whether it's oil and gas and the tourists, or whether it's for the chemicals for growing more food for the population. And we're stuck. That's a micro uh, example of how the Western civilization or the Northern Hemisphere has just expanded with the chemical industry, with the coal, with the extraction industries. And it brings so much relief. And at the same time, it brings so much danger. So, go ahead, Ken. I think you have to add one more detail to- Only one? <laughs> to, to comparing capitalism and communism. It's the embargo, right? They can't get this stuff uh, because the places where those st that stuff is made are, they're they're not allowed to, to buy from those places, so they're they're very limited in what they can get because of embargoes. So it's not just whether they're communists; it's whether they're being treated the same as other countries who can get swim pants. Yeah, and wow. my own take on that is that um, neither the pure communist model nor the pure capitalist model uh, really works. Both of them need to be moderated. Is going to be somewhere in the middle, I would think. But uh, that's a whole different political discussion. But anyway, the guy was saying to me when he swam up to us in the water, he cannot go into our resort. If he were to do that, he would be handcuffed and taken to jail. So, you know, uh, the resorts are just, just for the tourists or for the people who are working in the resorts. He was able to get there because he swam there along the shore and his father worked at the adjacent resort. So he could come through that way. Um, I uh, I have uh, similar stories of uh, friends of mine who have been to Cuba on bicycle tours, and um, <clears throat> something that's on my bucket list to do. But uh, they don't have the same kind of gear that we have here. So my friend said, "Yeah, when they left, they left their bike shoes with them, their gloves, their helmets, whatever they could leave beyond bike shorts, all that stuff, because it's something they can't get there." Well, that still brings up what I'm trying to talk about: is the desire of humanity, the individual, to have the helmet made of plastic, to have the shoes made of plastic, neoprene, uh, the other kinds of things that come from oil and gas, which methane, which is romantically called natural gas. And that's the dichotomy we have in the Northern Hemisphere and the uh, Western Hemisphere, or the, the problem we have. How are we going to give this up to save the planet when we want these desirous things? And we need these silicones, we need this better new uh, minerals to put into the ground so we can grow more food to feed more people. How in the world are we really gonna solve these problems? So I'll just keep that on the side there. But I love the trip that you had and the people you met there. And yeah, yeah. Ken, um, you had something also? Go ahead. Oh, yeah, quite a few more topics to talk about. Uh, one yeah. relates to the food. People ask, what is the food like? Well, a lot of guava, papaya, <laughs> a mango, pineapple, a lot of fresh fish. Uh, because of the embargo, I guess, because they have a lack of exchange funds for exchange, they don't have a lot of the same food choices that we have here in uh, New York, uh, but a lot of fresh fish that was good. And um, let's see a few other things, rice cucumbers, a lot of beans, a lot of rice. Yeah. And uh, I will say, as we drove by the countryside, the, the horses and the cattle were a little bit slender compared to what we have uh, here in the States. Um, now, one thing, the uh, fellow who, who we met in the water who asked for my pants, we were I was asking him about health care. I said, they say that Cuba has good health care. He said, absolutely. He said, anything they want, if they go to the hospital, they go to a doctor, they need health care. There's never a bill. So that he was very, uh, very proud about that, I guess, very pleased. So, I mean, that's a very important aspect of quality of life. So they do have that. Uh, they have uh, doctors and nurses that make house calls, actually. And okay, yeah. The way the system works there is doctors and nurses are assigned a certain number of clients and they, you know, they're rewarded or, you know, they get promotions of the higher salary, whatever, based on whether or not their their clients get sick or not. 
So it's kind of a wellness idea rather than treat the sick, keep people ha healthy to start with and not overwhelm the hospitals and the doctor's offices. Sure. Wow. I didn't know that. But could you explain what a house call is? The doctor or a nurse would go visit a, pay, a, a, a client and just like check on their on their health what their diet is if they're you know make suggestions in terms of if you know if they're missing something in their diet um you know check their vital signs you know their heart and, and all that kind of stuff and but this is done at the home or the apartment or the farm of the person not in a centralized right hospital or clinic right. that's right. amazing that's at the old days that I've seen in America. Yeah. I guess in China they call them barefoot doctors, but that that so, impressed uh, me that that was how they delivered health care in in Cuba. That's very yeah, impressive. Yes, the, the Cuban and, doctors go all over the world. They're very common in Africa. Uh, they went to some of the European countries in the uh, first year of COVID. Uh, Cuba sent their doctors. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. But. Um, so in terms of more of the uh, things in the ocean, I saw a lot of great fish on the snorkeling trip. I saw a lot of a number of giant anchors from the, what I'm guessing were old Spanish galleons. Um, saw a lot of fish like zebra fish, um, red snapper. Uh, people in my party saw a lot of young barracudas. Um, so um, there were no sharks, oddly, and uh, I think it's because the water was very calm. And it was fairly shallow, maybe 20 feet. I'm guessing perhaps the sharks prefer to be more pelagic out where it's uh, rougher ocean waters. I don't know. But I was surprised by that because the they said that we were quite safe. Go ahead. Um, I, have you ever been to the dry tortugas in Florida? Because I was wondering what the comparison. Oh, no, I have. No. Uh, but Because uh, there's... there's oh. um, the barracuda down at the tri took it the barracuda is actually begging for food. Were they doing that <laughs> where you are? Uh, no, I didn't see that. No. Oh. But they were protected somewhat by the coral reefs. And of course there was there was some coral bleaching down there. I'd say it might have been uh, you know, close to half of the coral was bleached. Are they doing anything to protect the coral reefs? That you, you uh, that I'm not sure about. Um I, I don't know if it's it's gotten that far if they're if they're working on that or not. I know they do have projects to uh, protect turtles, the sea turtles on various parts of the island and and even to heal them if they've been injured by a boat or a fishnet or something. Oh, they do have that? some environmental uh, uh, treatments or environmental awareness of, of what they're, what's going on mm -hmm. besides yeah. the people. Any um, talk about see. sea level rise? Um, that I couldn't tell just just from being there. I'm sure it's happening, but uh, it wasn't obvious from my point of view. Um, that spot so, uh, looks like a very narrow spit of land. How, what was the width? It, it was never uh, wider than a mile. But it had a little bit of elevation, so it wasn't like Cape Hatteras where the waves can crash all the way through. Uh, it, uh, it was had more vegetation and was more solid. Nice. Oh. But, uh, and you were able to actually go snorkeling at the coral reefs? Uh, yeah, Catamaran took us out there, yeah. Uh, and the colors were, beautiful. were dull or were they br brilliant? Oh yeah, they were quite they're brilliant and clear, yeah. Wow. I was at the uh, coral reefs in the Coral Sea of Australia uh, 10, 15 years ago and they were dull very dull and that surprised the heck out of me i was very hurt by that and there's these bright beautiful colored fish uh, of multiple colors out in the salt water but here was the coral and i heard so much about it but it was not uh, there mm -hmm. and in the bahamas uh, you mentioned feeding the fish or the fish were looking for food uh i paradise island the hotel people would go out with bread and throw it out there and there would be swarms of fish coming in to grab it. So they were teaching the, the fish to eat the food that was given by the human beings. Um, and th these were mainly angel fish that I saw, but big, not little angel fish that are inches. So these were five, six, seven, eight inches fish, all clear, uh, 
a whitish to clear. Beautiful. Years ago, um, during the Reagan administration, uh, some a friend of mine went birding, uh, took a birding trip uh, to Cuba. Uh, she had to go in through Canada. So they went to Canada with their uh, Birds of the West Indies field guides and uh, took a plane from Toronto to, to uh, Havana. And there are 18 different species of birds that were found nowhere else in the world but Cuba. And so their goal was to see, you know, all 18. Uh, one of those was the ivory-billed woodpecker, which they did not see. Uh, but they, um, most of the people there were, were older people. It, it was a very expensive trip. Uh, my friend was, was in her 20s, and there was only one other person in their 20s. So they hung out together, and he spoke Spanish. And so he's asking everybody, what's it like to live under Castro? And he was all thrilled. He could just, he's like, wow, I'm in Cuba. I'm in Cuba. This is neat. And, uh, of course, asking people about Castro uh, made the uh, official government guide of their trip um, pay a little bit of attention to him and, and my friend. And they got detained. And uh, there's a place called Zapata Swamp which is a place, there's more than one endemic species, I have two or three, but one of them was the possibility of an ivory-billed woodpecker. And um, it was the last place they were ever seen, it was, it was in Cuba. Uh, they even volunteered to help restore them to the United States, and the state government was like, oh, no, 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 we can't have Cuba helping restore a woody woodpecker. Um, <laughs> and, and so anyway, so so the, the people are going to say, why were you asking people uh, when Castro is going to go to Zapata Swamp. And my friend is like, look, if you can have somebody spy on us, have them get their facts straight. We never said any such thing. Uh, and they were kind of freaked out that she had the gumption to talk back to them. Uh, but anyway, they ended up releasing them and nothing nothing happened. But um, the, the, the point is that with, and it was 18 species of birds seen nowhere else in the world, plus a whole bunch of hummingbirds and, and things like that. Uh, it's a place that birders go to, and they've been going to whether it was legal or not. A lot of endemic plant species as well. That like that, yeah, yeah. Anywhere else, and and like things like orchids and you know tropical plants. And we still hear stories about the ivory-billed woodpecker sightings here and there, but I don't know if any of them are real, whether it's Arkansas or Cuba. Not agree with all the other people who are cynical that no none of them have ever been seen. Yeah, yeah. It, it's called it's a bird of slang is stringing when you make a bird into a better bird. So you see a, a pileated woodpecker out of the corner of your eye and you want so much for the ivy bill woodpecker <laughs> that all the field marks of your ivy bill just somehow they get into your eye, but they never get into your camera. <laughs> that that uh, sums up the trip to Cuba. But I'd like to uh, talk for a moment about uh, uh, getting to Cuba from Montreal and uh, spending some time in the Montreal area before the Cuba trip and after the Cuba trip. And I guess I would start by saying, uh, spent some time up at Mont Tremblant, took the gondola up at the, to the top of Mont Tremblant. I was able to see a few marmots up there. And uh, I guess marmot is maybe in the uh, groundhog family, uh, but they, were, they looked like two adults that were yeah. brownish beige and a young one that was uh, jet black. And, um, so that was nice. Um, I was told by the people up there that, you know, there are wolves and bears, you know, up in, up in that area. Um, so I spent some time also in a downtown Montreal, close to the site of the 1984 Olympic Stadium and that area. And they've done a pretty good job in terms of repurposing those buildings and that land. Uh, so, for example, they've got a, a biodome, which I spent some time at, and I'll talk about that more in a moment. It's got just three different environments in it. It's got like polar environment. It's got a Laurentian maple forest environment. And it's got a tropical uh, forest environment. And uh, But um, in addition, uh, just in terms of repurposing, they've got a huge skateboard park. They've kept the big old bicycle park, the velodrome. Uh, they've got a, uh, a big old uh, insectarium. I really wanted to get to it, but I ran out of time. They have a beautiful botanical garden wow. outdoors. 
with like a Japanese garden, a Chinese garden, a gigantic rose garden. Uh, they've got um, a, a few other things that are really uh, are a plus for the city. They repurposed in a, in a very good way. Um, planetarium also as a part of it. So in the uh, first of the uh, three big areas of the biodome uh, was the Laurentian forest. Uh, and that included, uh, you know, live animals, you know, from what would, <laughs> from what would be in the uh, Laurentian type maple forest that's common in Canada and around the Great Lakes. So I've always been incredibly curious about Canada lakes and what do they have there, but a Canada lakes. I imagine it was pretty lonely, but it was a little bigger than I expected. It was over 30 pounds. Uh, beautiful. It was camouflage right in the rocky background, uh, the the rocky uh, cliff face that it was uh, that was its habitat there. Uh, so it was beautiful to see. They had uh, river otters playing there in one of the exhibits. Uh, they had um, uh, beavers in their den with a camera going right into the den where you could see them. And they also had a big uh, uh, aquarium, so I could see Atlantic sturgeon, which I'd always heard about. We have them right here in New York. New York Harbor, actually, but I'd never seen one. So it was nice to see one there. They had a few of them, actually. And then in terms of the tropical forests, that was a, an amazing exhibit as well. They had something called tamarinds, golden lion tamarinds. It's in the uh, you know chimpanzee a primate species, but it's very small. It's only about a foot, but they're incredibly beautiful, golden-colored uh, monkey. And... Uh, so about a foot tall. There were a number of them, very playful. Uh, then they had uh, capybara, which is an enormous rodent from South America. And that blended right in with the scenery. It's very hard to see. So in other words, you'd be looking at it, but not able to distinguish it until maybe it moved just uh, an inch or two, and then we could make it out. They had hyacinth macaws, scarlet macaws, roseate spoonbills, all you know, quite beautiful and amazing to see. And then they had an Arctic and Antarctic uh, exhibit with uh, many different species of penguins, puffins, and birds like that. Um, in terms of other things related to the Montreal area, uh, the subway system was very interesting. Of course, it's much newer than the New York City subway, so it's much cleaner, it's lighter. Um, one of the things I like the best about it is that the train is at the same level as the uh, as the platform. So in other words, there's no way to fall down six or eight feet into the platform. You know, the, the train comes right up to your level and you just walk on. So it's much safer and it's very quiet. It's very fast. They've got a lot of stops, very clean. The people were very polite. They actually offered me their seats, which I'm not used to in New York. Uh, I love the part where the train was at the same level as the uh, uh, passengers are when they're stepping in. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So there's no yeah, and, bottom piece. In the New York City subways, if it's raining or damp, it would be very easy to slip on the tracks here mm -hmm. in our system. And go straight down and not be uh, saved, you might say, either by oneself or by other people rushing over there to grab you and pull you back right. in and electrocuted. Yeah. Mark's comment about the, the subway. Um, I find that in New York City, there's two signs of old age that I think we have that most places don't. Uh, one, um, people offer you a seat on the subway. And two, you take it. <laughs> uh, do any of us take the seats? <laughs> I do. Good for you. <laughs> I, I do. I do. I, I remember there was a point where somebody was talking about people offering them a seat, and I'm thinking, ah, I'm going to, when I'm that old, I'm not going to take the seat. But well, when I got to be that old, <laughs> I took the seat. <laughs> I'll also mention uh, there was a, a zip line right uh, in one of the neighborhoods along the St. Lawrence River. So my friend and I uh, did the zip line. Uh, it was a lot of fun. It was the structure on which the zip line was constructed was. Uh, um, a little bit shaky, so I, I was worried walking up it. And then where we left off to do the zip lining, we're a good 200 feet above the ground, so it was uh, a little bit frightening. I did it on a whim, 
if I'd had more time to think about it, I might have chickened out, but I didn't. I didn't want to lose face. So anyway, it was a good ride. <laughs> uh, some people were actually wave, holding on with one hand and waving. I wasn't didn't feel confident enough to do that. I was hanging on for dear life, but uh, didn't die. So it was pretty good. <laughs> and uh, the uh, the final thing of Montreal was there was a little boy in our party. He just turned five. So uh, his parents took a, him in the party to a gigantic trampoline park up there. Uh, there were probably like 70 or 80 trampolines with 100 uh, little kids jumping up and down on it and a few adults as well. So that was a lot of fun. So that was my uh, trip to Montreal and Cuba. Uh, thank you. <laughs> well, how long were you in Montreal? Three days before and three days after. Oh, you had to go back there, right? Yes, yeah, we flew back into Montreal. Yeah. So you were three days, right? Six days. And in Cuba, how long were you there? Uh, eight days. Eight days. That's a long, wow. You had two weeks. And the flight was incredibly quick. It was only three hours and 17 minutes down, three hours and 18 minutes back. Well, I love these trips that Lenny has been doing or did do and that Mark has just come back from. Uh, because they show us different environments, human environments that are out there and how people are living and working in those kinds of environments. I wish we had the time and the ability for all of us to go over to Stockholm and see that beautiful area there and compare it to Tokyo and London and some of these other places in Washington, D.C. for the particular subjects we're talking about here. That would really give us some wonderful insight and, and to talk to those people. But uh, that's why that's so good and why I'd like to bring in Lenny's lit, uh, recent bike tour and Mark's definite uh, tour of uh, Montreal and uh, Cuba. All right. Uh, you want to uh, sum up everything there on Montreal? or? Yeah, beautiful environment, uh, close to nature, close to the mountains, right on the edge of the St. Lawrence River. Uh, some amazing take-ins in terms of things like the planetarium and the uh, botanical garden and the biodome and things like that. So it's uh, well worth uh, visiting. Well, that's about it for this episode of the Environment TV Forum. We hope that you enjoyed it and please feel free to contact us with your thoughts and comments. We believe that the environment covers the entire universe and that an environmental communications network is the least that we can build to help describe that universe. Until that time, we will do our part in bringing to you, the viewer, as much as we can, and we welcome your involvement in making that happen. So if you want to become part of this and build such an environmental communications network, you can contact us at the link on your screen. Until next time, enjoy nature and all that it has to offer before it's too late. I'm Charlie Olson for the Environment TV Forum.